American is a relative term. What is American? Personally, I think the borders, you know, just a speed bump in between two countries. As a child, I think we took TJ for granted. Not because it was a different country to me. To me, it was just like, oh, it's just TJ. It's where the other half of my family lives. And even if I was in TJ my entire life, being this far north, you are sort of removed from the other parts of Mexico and the culture. And you're Mexican, but you don't really know. My last restaurant was Mexican, and we were all Mexican, and we all were cooking things that were new to us. Because unless you're exposed to it as a child or you live it, it's foreign to you, even though it's Mexican. Have you ever butchered a fish before? No? Oh. You're gonna learn today. Okay, we'll do this one right now and then we'll butcher another one. So we can run it out the special if we have time. Claudette is really invaluable to San Diego because she is a local, she's a native, you know? I mean, there are a lot of people that have left. San Diego has such a rich Mexican culture we always have. It was just a, a constant flow of ideas and creativity and, you know, um, cultural mores. I always try to be close to the water. It's when I feel most whole. Also, we're spoiled in San Diego where you can get fish literally straight off the fishermen's boats. To me, it means a little bit more than going to, you know, a giant purveyor. Pescado San Diego's from Nayarit. My dad, he loves the water. He always loved fish. So Nayarit's food is very special too. And the Sarandiala will be hopefully like my nod to Santiago Escuincla. The fish gets filleted a certain way, so it's still connected at the head, at the tail. You open it, it's gutted. Put it between, it looks like kind of like a torture device. <laughs> so it creates a perfect basket for it to grill in fully. you have to, you know, really watch it because it's usually a thin fish. It's usually red snapper. It goes wrong really, really quick, especially with an open flame, which is not a gas minutely controlled device. Open flame varies from, you know, second to second. But when you get it right, you know, when you get that char on it, and char is one of Mexico's special charms. The fact that she's trying to pull that dish off in El Jardin is um, crazy and it may, may not be an incredibly smart move. But I like that. That's why Claudette made her name. Food scene in San Diego was a wasteland for, I mean, years and years and years. And I think that chefs came here because, you know, they could go to LA and be, you know, yet another voice in the chorus, you know, or they could come to a city like San Diego that still had a lot of room to grow. The Mexican food that we grew up with in San Diego was, you know, $3 rolled tacos in a bag. It was a very fast, very cheap food. I mean, sure, you could find authentic Mexican restaurants, but the majority of San Diego only saw the fast food. Anybody who's tried to do high-end Mexican cuisine in San Diego has failed. It's a really tough sell. You know, luckily it's come of age. So, welcome to El Jardín. I got a call from uh, the wine director at my last restaurant, and he said, hey, you know, I have a friend that's a restaurateur in San Diego, and he wants to open a Mexican concept and wants to see if you'll consult. It was a Baja Med concept he wanted to bring to Liberty Station here in San Diego, and it just wasn't me. I left for Top Chef Mexico, and it really just, 
it opened up what I could do. It was like, oh shit. like this is at my disposal. So when I came back, I said, Johan, are you still in? Yeah, absolutely. I said, cool, I wanna change the concept. I'm still Mexican food, and I said, but Baja Med is nothing, it doesn't mean something to me. Let's go regional, let's cover this entire country. Let's take that box that gets put around Mexican food and what you have to be in Mexican food. Like, let's literally, as cliche as it sounds, let's like tear the wall down. And I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna do the regional cuisine. I really need to understand what the hell that means. Everyone in the North always gets made fun of when you go further South, that even, you know, people from Tijuana, they stick out like sore thumbs in cities like Mexico City. Finding the ingredients and being curious and stopping at this person's house and in this restaurant, asking them what's in it. Mexico is a país de migrantes y de inmigrantes. La comida mexicana is difficult to definir porque no existe una sola comida mexicana. It's really a mix of, you know, 15, 20 different cultures, a lot of which didn't receive a warm welcome in the United States. Tiene influencias prácticamente de todos los continentes, pero lo que sucede es que se crean eh, sabores únicos, porque si bien tenemos técnicas prehispánicas y técnicas europeas, Esto, por ejemplo, también se come. Es la cosa del cayo. Sí, sí. Y normalmente la gente lo mira. Mexicans take the food of these other cultures and go, oh, this is nice, yeah. Now we're gonna mix it with our stuff. <laughs> Voila! We have fideo seco, you know, and you take the shawarma and we turn it into al pastor. There's just no rules. Por lo tanto, creo que si cualquier cocinero intenta hacer cocina auténtica y tradicional fuera de México, no importa tanto la receta. Lo más importante es tener el producto original. She's got a new concept coming up, so you know there's a lot of a lot of product research that now I'm going to have to do, you know, because she's bringing in a lot of new product that a lot of our chefs in San Diego aren't familiar with. You can cook the food and it won't taste the same if you don't put the same ingredients that they use in Mexico, because then that's when you lose it. That's what's like, oh no, it's better in Oaxaca. Well, of course, because, because the, ingredients. the ingredients. That's what she's trying to really you know, bring to the plate, bring to the table, the flavors. She knows what she wants. She knows where it's gonna come from. She knows what it's gonna taste like. Um, this is the garden. The idea is for uh, everyone in the kitchen to touch soil at least once a day. Uh, Cook's having a bad day. Go out and pull weeds, you know, get off the line. We'll cover him, but I think humans need to touch soil and we need to take our shoes off and walk in the dirt and kind of that holistic approach to it. The reason why Mexican food is so special in Mexico is really because of the ground that these ingredients grow in. It's, it's virgin land, uncharted territory, you know, and everything I know about Mexico, it's people that work with their hands. I got invited to cook Cinco de Mayo dinner in Puebla, in Puebla City downtown Puebla. If you walk around, you can see the colonialism. We dedicated a whole day to go visit this family of a Tlachiquero, and a Tlachiquero is someone that 
preserves the art of making pulque. Pulque is a fermented agave drink. Alberto is from a family of tlachiqueros, and he takes it incredibly serious. I'm trying to figure out how to get Alberto's pulque al El Jardín. It would be a crime to not have pulque, because then that's not painting the full picture of everything that we have. We go on this hike with Alberto and to go siphon the aguamiel from the different agaves he has. Agaves need to grow years, eight years, to get a really good piña. If you start picking them when they're this big, you're just killing your land. So he's showing us this process that he goes through of siphoning it. When he approaches the agave that he's going to like cut into, he just goes silent. And he touches it at the heart, and he just closes his eyes. You know whatever that connection is happening, to him is the most sacred moment of his day. And he is asking for permission to cut into its heart. Everything that is living needs to be asked permission before you take from it. And that was like the strongest message that you can base your life off of. That moment right there is his best like tribute to his roots. Yes, you look at look at Nosotros, como un pueblo indígena, aún conservamos este, nuestra lengua y tenemos, sentimos que tenemos esa conexión con el maguey. Tenemos que tenerle mucho respeto, como él nos tiene respeto a nosotros. Nosotros no lo dañamos, él tampoco no nos daña. Eh, nos, este, al contrario, nos alimenta de, de lo que produce él. En el pueblo tratamos de rescatar eso, de enseñarle a nuestros hijos y platicarle a nuestros hijos que le enseñen a sus hijos para que esto no se pierda. Hablar de cocina mexicana eh, tendría que ser más bien las cocinas mexicanas. Recipes are a family tree. They tell the story of your mom, of your grandma, of your great grandma, you know, and they tell the story of the land too. They tell the story of, you know, how um, the region has developed, how, you know, new ingredients have been brought in, what's really worked and thrived there. Alberto's mom is there. And I had one tortilla and I tasted the mole that she had and it was just tortillas and this sauce. That was one of the best bites I'd had. had. I said, is this mole poblano, is this mole rojo? Like what, and she's like, it's just mole. You know, to her, it's, just, it's no big deal. That's the beauty of these women. They're not impressed by themselves or what would they make, because to them, it's just their food that feed their families. I was like, can I buy what you made? And she started laughing at me and she's like, I mean, it's liquid. And I was like, it's fine. And she gave me a Tupperware container and I vacuum sealed it and brought it home. En el caso de las mujeres, la transmisión de la cultura gastronómica se da de otra forma. Entre los pueblos indígenas, las niñas empiezan a hacer sus primeras tortillas desde que son muy pequeñas. La madre les enseña cómo trabajar el maíz o cómo matar una gallina y cocinarla. Entonces, la transmisión de la cultura se da en las cocinas y en el campo. Y es de esta forma en la que se van heredando las recetas de generación en generación. Mole had to be on the first menu. So I grab a base and because I'm from the north and the influence that Chinese and Japanese immigrants have given to Baja Norte, how do you infuse more flavor into things, umami? 
if you make a stock, a dashi kombu base, it transcends the traditional, like, okay, this was good. So the Pengas and Namal Mola is going to have a dashi kombu base with a masa colada tamal, super soft, tender, pasture bird, free range chicken that has been braised within the mole sauce and the dashi and the stock and the vegetables. And all that comes together on a plate. Just a tamal and mole. If these women don't have girls, the recipes stop with them. The line of history stops with them. Whether they are in textiles, in food, in aguardiente, these traditions literally stop with them. That's like a crime to me. Like, you know, it's, it's history, it's Mexico. I grew up in Imperial Beach, California, which is literally connected to TJ by the Tijuana River and the Sloughs. So, border kid, born and raised. I grew up with three boys and one and myself. Our household was very traditional in the sense that we had roles. Mexican culture has its roles of who does what in the household. Um, and I had to cook, clean, you know, help my mom be in the kitchen. The women in my family are probably the strongest broads I've ever had to encounter. But again, it always kind of defaulted to the women running the families. My tia Lore is another one of those pillars in the person that I've grown up to be and the person that I still strive to be. Entonces ya de aquí lo pones, lo pones en exacto. Y todo lo que los grumos que se quedan abajo ahí, igual. Ahí se tira eso. eso, eso se lava, eso ya no sirve. Ya, ahí llevas esto a la lumbre. Lo prendes. Ajá. Gracias. Que venimos de una madre guerrera. Mi madre quedó viuda embarazada de mí. Entonces, con cinco hijos, y tuvo que ser guerrera para sacarnos adelante a todos. Y de ahí nació la, la familia de mujeres guerreras. My aunt widowed very young, and then she married again. She said she was eight months pregnant, and she was kind of like, okay, I gotta do something. Like, like I gotta do something to feed my family, to push, push this along. And my grandma Lola was like, why don't you just start a pozole stand? Like, so pozole. So this started as a tiny little stand and then she had a full-fledged restaurant. Pozole gave her the opportunity to give the kids a life she didn't have. All of this started with pozole. Probably one of the most controversial soups in Indian indigenous culture. El pozole is un plato Eh, mucho más antiguo que, que la nación mexicana como tal. Normalmente el pozole en, en el día a día en las culturas prehispánicas era preparado con la carne de un, de un roedor de buen tamaño, un roedor que existía en lo que era Mesoamérica y Centroamérica y con eso hacían el pozole de todos los días. Sin embargo, los estudios históricos y antropológicos confirman que para ciertas festividades, sobre todo de carácter religioso, los sacerdotes, posteriormente al sacrificio de algunos hombres en, en honor a sus deidades, ofrecían el corazón a, a esas deidades y posteriormente descuartizaban el cuerpo de ese hombre y esta carne era cocida en este mismo caldero con maíz y con algunas hierbas. Pero lo único que sucedió es que llegaron los españoles y debido a sus creencias religiosas se prohibió que en toda la Nueva España se consumiera la carne humana y la carne que se encontró que tenía el sabor más similar al del ser humano, pues es la del cerdo. 
Kor and Hominy have been, you know, massively important to that culture forever. You know, and, you know, Fazole, aside from just being terribly delicious and slow cooked and lovely, you know, I mean, is, you know, it's a, it's a celebratory dish. There's something very comforting to just about slow cooked stews, you know, and that's a lot of what, um, what Mexican food is. You know, a lot of it wasn't based on glorious cuts of the animal. It was based on, you know, maybe the less sexy cuts that weren't instantaneously um, amazing to eat. You know, with time and with fire and with, you know, a braise, you know, you're gonna end up with something glorious. I've had conversations with my aunt. Thank you for giving me this. Now I'm going to show you what I kind of twist it to, you know? Again, mixing with that whole, the dashi kombu base. Then you incorporate uh, Meyer lemons that have been preserved. Pozole is one of those dishes that when it lands on your table, it is unique to you. And the broth is poured table side so you can see how it will melt the preserved Meyer lemons and blend in with all the meats. She knows how to do the basics, but she's also willing to take risks. You know, I mean, you take something like that specialty dish, it's really important to her because it has a story rooted in Mexico, you know, where, you know, she spent her childhoods, where she has family, you know, and that's her culture here. You know, she's a bi-border kid. You know, she's seen both sides. And if you can take that story and execute it in a kitchen on this side of the border, that's awesome. We're gonna go tamar tamales to the woman on seat one. I'm trying to take these recipes that these women have and not duplicate them because I have my own style of where I've been, where I come from and what I've seen and I kind of like smashed it all together and it's my food, it's my style. But I hope to spark a curiosity in people that come to this restaurant and they say, ah, this is what Mexican food is. This is what Mexico is. This is all these flavors you can find in Mexico? Holy crap. I feel like food is the one common thing that everyone has with each other. There always will be a need for someone to cook food. It's the most blue collar, humbling job you can have. You know, chefs get glamorized, but at the end of the day, I have the same job that the woman that makes food in Mexico for a family of six that cleans their house and is also their caretaker. She does the same thing that I do. She makes people happy with what she makes. You know, I'm a cook before I'm a chef. I'm a mom before I'm a chef. Just the voice that she gives for, for females in the kitchen too. I mean, we don't have very many female-led kitchens. It's been a boys club for far too long. You want females telling their own food story. You want you know, people of color. You want people of all kinds of ethnicities, you know, telling their original stories. And that's what Claudette's doing. That story's important because it's our story. I think the best thing that we as chefs can do is invoke memories or remind people of things in their life. Best compliments I have ever gotten is, this reminds me of my grandma's food, and they're not Mexican. And that's like, ding. That's what keeps me doing what I do. As soon as someone says, my grandma used to make this, but it wasn't this. But it was, it reminded them of that, like, that feeling they got when they ate it, the warmth. And it's ugly, but it's delicious. A mí me gustaría que la gente que busca probar cocina mexicana sepa que cuando se lleva a la boca un trozo, se está llevando siglos de cultura a la boca. Se está llevando el esfuerzo de personas que no tienen nada más que su trabajo. Que cuando una persona prueba un platillo mexicano, 
está probando la historia, la cultura, los sentimientos y la herencia de cientos de años, de generaciones, de familias. I love, you know, calling out pozole and I love calling out enchiladas suizas. You know, those little things that take me back to being a kid or things that I like to eat. And these women that we represent and these women that are in this blood, sweat and tears in the soul of this restaurant, it's their energy that brings people back. The moment I am looking most forward to is having my mom and my aunt sit at a table and not order, not give them menus, and just treat them. Thank you.